Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, genderidentitytoday.com. This content right here is brought to you by subscribers of genderidentitytoday.com. If you're already a subscriber, let me just first say thank you for your ongoing support, because you know pretty dang well that subscribers not only receive new content directly to their email uh, inboxes as soon as it publishes, but are also able to interact with every contributor directly. And hell, that means me too. And, and if you don't want to interact with me, I'm not sure why you're listening to this. So if you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other podcasts, videos, and all the written articles by our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find down there in the show notes. All right, today I am very, very excited to be speaking with Max Carey. Hi, Max. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for having me here today. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for thank you for showing up. Max is a producer and a director, and as well as, as having actually many, many TV credits to uh, to his name, Max's first full feature length feature length film as both producer and director. Di- I'm murdering this. Victory director. Right? <laughs> right? It's almost the same thing if you think about it. What is what is a director doing but creating sort of a artistic directory of the content? See? There same, you go. Same. Thank you for helping me out there, because I was just I was falling on my face, wasn't I? Well, you're wearing the royal color. I have to show certain <laughs> deference, you know. Purple is the royal color, or, you know. By after you're that you're that by by uh, by default, that makes you uh, royal something something. I am I am blushing over here. So thank you. I don't know you. if you define as a I don't know if you define as a king or a queen or a prince or a jester or a, just one of them some other royal person, but you are royal nonetheless. I got to think of myself as a princess, I think. I don't know why, mm. but a princess will work fine. Not okay. quite, you know, having to to take over any kind of royal duties, but, uh, you know, certainly up there and, and people take photographs and whatever. How about if I finish I, the I, intro? You, 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 could, you could identify as a princess. I would definitely identify as a court jester. All right. I can see mm. that after the last half mm. hour we've been talking for sure. So, but the point here, Max's first feature length film as both producer and director is a documentary. And this documentary is called Touch Kink. It's about the BDSM and, well, it's about BDSM and kink culture. And, uh, you know, quick confession that probably everybody listening already knew. I have some interest in both of these subjects. And so... Max and I are talking. So thank you so much, Max, for, for coming and and talking a little bit about this. I I wanna, if I if I may, I wanna start off like young Max Carey. <laughs> right. What what was originally, what originally, because I can think about what put me down, put me on this path, but what originally like set put ah, put you on the path to document BDSM? I mean, what put you here? What? How come you're here now? Why are we talking? How far do you want to go back? Goodness. The beginning Six, of this film eight. or to me as an awkward teenager. <laughs> yeah, awkward uh, teenager. Awkward teenager. Okay. Uh, yeah, awkward teenager did not get along, did not understand, didn't fit in in my small little town. I felt quite claustrophobic, even mildly suicidal, if I'm honest, because I suspected the world was more than thou shalt follow these three roles in this small town. And if you don't, you are a weird person. Uh, And then when I started traveling and discovering what I suspected to be true was actually true, that not everywhere in the world thought the same way. And that there were a whole bunch of different ways to live and a whole bunch of different cultures that had a whole bunch of different ideas about these things, many of which I agreed with, many of which I did not agree with. But just the knowledge that there was no one true way I could breathe again and I felt happy again just to know that, you know, what I suspected that this wasn't some sort of rules passed down from the universe is the parents and people in my culture kind of made it sound that these were some sort of universal rules passed down by the powers that be or whatever and thou shalt follow these 
uh, just discover that was bullshit and that there's a million different ways to live your life. That was the beginning of the adventure. And so then you wanted to, because I mean, you know, fast forward. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it was good because if you look at Western culture and, and you're, you are, you were born in the United States, I believe, right? You said, okay. Canada, but close enough. Oh, Canada. Yeah, close enough. Um, yeah. But if you, <laughs> sorry. But for any of your Canadian listeners, I was just, you know, there's a thing about Canadians. Americans think Canadians are nice. They, they think that we're all like particularly polite and nice. No, we're actually not. We just know that sometimes you guys have guns. So we're just pretending to be nice with you most of the time. It's not really <laughs> generally politeness. It's just, you know, we know that you guys could be armed. So we pretend to be nice. And, and you know, it. <laughs> that's pretty much the rest of the world has done the same. They're like, oh, yeah, the Americans might shoot us if we don't be nice to them. So it's a bummer that you've really described American foreign policy in like one sentence. So there you go. But if you look at Western society, you, you'll you notice that that uh, that you know, alternative lifestyles, alternative ideas about sex are certainly not prized. I mean, we, you don't have to go back very far. You can look in, in, you know, the Old Testament of the Bible and right. Ham lay with his, bro, uh, his father, Noah, after seeing his nakedness and got sent off to the land of Nod, all of that happy crappy. I mean, I'm sure it's really truthful, but kink is reviled. So, so why would you go down this path? Was it to show the powers that be, to give them like a, a, a figurative middle finger. Wow. <laughs> you know, it's funny. And it, when you asked that question, I was thinking about a macro level or a micro level. On a macro level, I actually don't think any of this is unusual at all. I think this has been around and has been around forever. Ask any dominatrix who the biggest clients are. There are all those people telling you that they're, this is bad. Right. You know, so there's, a, there's this amazing hypocrisy. Uh, where a lot of the people that you would say by day, oh, thou shalt not do this, this is terrible. They're the people paying for it. And, uh, you know, from from from, uh, from a dominatrix point of view, anyway, the macro view. So I think this there's nothing unusual about any of this. The micro view, um, looking at it from, I just wanted to tell a story that I discovered. I... I'm a queer person. I, I never really quite fit into the gay community initially. They kind of took a little while to add the Q. Um, you know, I didn't really feel like I was part of that. I certainly wasn't part of this. And, you know, there's still ongoing discussions. It's funny, though, when I go to LGBTQ festivals now, it's hilarious because everybody's queer. So you're not queer. Mm -hmm. You're just straight up gay. There's nothing wrong with that. But why are you describing yourself as Q? You, you were like, whatever. Anyway, it, it, so I guess that's maybe that's a, a happy thing that everybody now is queer even if you're actually gay or straight or it just means what it means for you but um the reason i bring it up is that what really got the ball rolling is getting to know people getting to know that these mm -hmm. weren't weird people doing weird things and sacrificing whatever these were doctors and lawyers and your neighbors and people and the moment you humanize something the moment you know people and you know they're good people you care a lot less about who they want to shag, unless, of course, you want to shag them. Then if they don't want to shag you, it's disappointing. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Uh, <laughs> and it turns into <laughs> just competition, can, really, at that point. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But, you know, in the end of the day, it's just you once you start knowing lots of people, when people started coming out and, and you knew so many people, like I remember my grandmother, the day she was stopping homophobic is when she found out Liberace was gay. And she was kind of like, oh, but he's such a nice guy. And I like his music. Oh, I guess it's okay to be gay. That was it. Right. It was the right. first person that she respected, knew a lot about. So it's just that. So kink, I think, is sort of the logical next step because it's a little bit more complicated. You know, it can mean different things for different people. Some people, uh, are, it's totally non-sexual for some people in a classic way. Um, <laughs> then you get discussions, what is sex? But anyway, um, I just think it's the logical next thing, you know, uh, to discuss a more yeah. precise who you are. 
Maybe, and, and it's okay to be two people. Maybe you have a, the mean, tough, badass guy by day that, you know, works for SEAL Team 6, and you like to dress in women's clothing and get your wife uh, her slippers and her her uh, her cigar when she comes back from work. I mean, right. you can be both of those people. So I just think it, for people that feel like they can't talk about these things, for people that feel that maybe they're a little awkward like I was, just giving them the permission to say there's a system by which you can talk to people. Usually if they identify as kinky or kink aware, at least they're not going to shame you. Hopefully it's a little bit more likely that they're going to listen. It's a little bit more likely that they're not going to shame you. And you can talk about these things. doesn't mean that you're going to do these things with these people, but I just wanted to let people know about this wonderful land uh, filled with people that actually have beautiful hearts and are trying to be the most authentic selves. And it's called kinky land, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, an interesting point you brought up is that generally these people will listen, will listen better. I, I have spoken to several, I don't know the plural dominatrices. How would you, how do you Mm -hmm. say? Dominatrixes. (laughs) Yeah. Dominatrixes. That's a good question. Yeah, I don't I've know. Heard it. Now, I like to just go with Tom's. <laughs> Tom's. Let, let's do that. <laughs> but I've spoken to several several Tom's, and I've thought these people they're not living out their fantasies; they're living out somebody else's fantasy. And in order to be a good, a successful dominatrix, you have to be able to figure out what the fantasy is, which means you have to be pretty empathic. You can't just go in there with like a writing crop and say, now call me Madam President and smack somebody and like, then you're going to be a successful dominant. It's just like, it doesn't work that way. So your point that the kink people tends to kinky people tend to listen better. I mean, like, I think there's a greater empathy because I'm going to use we here because I think we see a greater picture. We see a greater human experience than just Saturday night, you know, missionary position lights off, you know, what's your thought on that? You, I, I, you, absolutely. You've got a, you know, I grew up in a beer culture in North America. And the reason I say that is that, uh, you know, when I got the chance to go to Europe, I learned about wine. And mm. wine is amazing and it has so many different kinds of things. But if I never knew about wine, how am I going to talk about it? Yeah. And we'd all agree wine's a pretty amazing thing. So I think being a dominatrix or uh, a kinky person is just about knowing about more stuff. The more you know, the better. One of the, one of the best gifts I've gotten from this process of spending seven years in this community and writing is I think I have a universal language because before it was very confusing. I talked to dominatrixes and they would use a certain language to describe this talk to spankos they use a different language talk about male doms a different language people into rubber a different language yeah. they all talk about it using different words and and in the end i realize it's it's they're all using different words but in the end it's we like what we like we see ourselves how we see ourselves would that be in that moment or for a while and we want a certain sensation, which may be sexual, it may be actually humiliation, maybe whatever. But get rid of all the other complicated languages, and that's it. We like what we like. We feel like who we are for a little while, for a long time. And we want we want to have whatever sensation. That's it. That's the universal field theory, depending on all of it. But you have to know the – but otherwise, it's like, well, I don't speak Japanese. I don't speak Spanko, so I don't know what they're talking about. I don't speak Femdom. I don't speak male dom. I don't speak leather daddy. I don't speak, well, mm. try and find that universal Esperanto of kink, shall we say. It's just to bring it back down to the simple, yeah, you like what you like, you know? And that's, that's you know, I get, I get so annoyed sometimes about I, I, uh, myself, too. It's like, there is not, kink doesn't exist. There's no such thing as kink in what people think it is, because theoretically it should be cannibalizing. So the moment anyone's talking about it, it's not really kinky anymore, is it? Because people are talking about it. And it's not really that unusual. I mean, maybe having sex point. with lights, having sex with the lights off now would probably be kinky because pretty much no one does that anymore. Victorian <laughs> swimwear. Victorian swimwear would probably be really kinky right now because nobody wears really? that. Yeah. Um, Gosh. 
so, know, what so, is Tiki? You know? Yeah. I mean, that was going to be my, one of my next questions was, I mean, how do we even define this? Cause like the things, the people I've known throughout life. And I mean, you know, I'm not, not exactly on my deathbed, but I've got a few years under me and like everybody I've known has just been like, well, yeah, here's kind of the weird things that I like. And I've continued to say, well, that's not weird. In fact, actually, I had a conversation with my stylist just last week. <laughs> so here you go, throwing this out here. And I said, oh, yeah, you know, sex is different. Because, I, I mean, I told you I went, I've got, I had gender affirming surgery this past summer. And so I'm like, so things are, things are different, you know. And we just started talking about sex. And she says, well, what weird things do you like? And I went, oh, here's this weird thing. And she goes, no, I do that. And then her friend, her, the the other stylist goes, oh, yeah, me too. Yeah, my boyfriend. Yeah, all of us. Yeah, we're all, it's, that's not weird at all. And I went, oh. And like part of me went, dang, I'm not special anymore. <laughs> part of me said that. But the other part of me went, so then what the hell is it? Like, is that kinky? Is that weird? Like, what what does that mean about me? That all my life I've thought, oh, this is a strange thing. I wouldn't, hey. But then four people apparently were just like, well, yes. So, so what is kink? Yeah. What, and one of the points, and let me bring this together, fear. sorry, but because one of your points with the film is to say everybody is kinky. So, so go ahead, go ahead. Who's into kink? I mean, it's theoretically, it's supposed to be in a minority sexual interest, uh, which a, first of all, not all kink has anything to do with sex at all. So that's, right. you know, there's one, one side of it. The other side of it is if it's a minority interest, then what are we at right now? Uh, climbing Mount Everest left-handed while singing, <laughs> singing a particular song. I don't think many people have done that. So I guess that would be kinky. <laughs> Seems uh, minority. You know, you know, it's not kinky. It was like, I, I was watching Deadpool versus Wolver Wolverine. I love how they're always putting in these like anal sex jokes with men and women. So, so like, you know, it's sort of like fun for him. He's, you know, it's very normal. And yeah, I sometimes do this and that and anal sex with men and women. And like, this is supposed to be mainstream TV. When I was a kid, that'd be like, oh my God. Oh, Just yeah. Anal alone, let alone he's open gender wise. I mean, right. so this, and if it's in a Marvel movie, you know that the the people, yeah, it's normal. And I do think this generation's coming up right now that are poly and gender fluid, and they're not bound by these same sort of bullshit that a right. lot of us were. And God bless them. I think they'll be much happier than we were. Oh gosh, yes, I think that's true. Maybe they'll have their their kink is going to be. We didn't get enough trauma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we weren't. Trauma. You know, it's true. It's like I, I have a weird thing about like I. I have lots of unpopular, not unpopular opinions, but unique opinions. And one, I, I also grew up Catholic and I, you know, I actually come really cool with that now because it gave me some of my best kinks, you know, having that sort of trauma and that kind of like oh. thing of like, thou shall not do this and thou shall not do that. It was really fun breaking those rules. I have to say, you know, where if I grew up, if I was grew up with it, that was all cool. I don't think I would have had as much fun. It's so a good even point. the, even some of the things like for some people, it's work through those things that you are supposed to feel guilty about. And it's fun to feel guilty. It's the old joke. Right. That there's, there's nothing dirty and nothing. There's nothing inherently dirty about sex or kink. Unless, unless of course you like that, then you're a dirty, dirty person. You know, <laughs> it's, if you want it to be dirty, great. You know, that's yeah. fun too, you know, but it isn't wrong. It isn't wrong. It's self. Uh, only thing is wrong is to do things unconsensually. You know, to 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 do something to another human being without any regard to their who they are, their consent, or their 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 person without any compassion. That's wrong. But if they want to be smacked across the face of the two by four and that's their thing, that's not wrong. If they I don't know that I'd want to do it. I don't think I'd want to do it because I'd be mm. too worried about the potential fallout. But hey. Oh yeah. But the, but it's not wrong, because you. I not mean, if, you had not said, if they are consenting and they are aware. I think that's the other thing is so important in, in kink. It's the big difference between the quote unquote kink community is it's the action. It's not the action; it's how it's done. I smack you across the face because you want me to, and we've discussed it. It's really your thing. Fine, smack you across the face. Well, none of that. It's it's definitely wrong. You know. 
one is right with your, you know, it's just, it's not the action. It's the process by which the action happens, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and there is a, a stereotype, I guess, particularly for BD, for people into BDSM, that these are mean people and angry people and hateful people is, um, you know what? I'm just going to say, is that true? Um, people are people. I'm not going to speak for every member of any community. There are people that really are angry, sadistic people that, um, this is their healthy vent for this, you know, uh, there's no yeah. one size fits all answer. I mean, I think some really, really nasty sadists or some, uh, really do have some pretty dark ideas, but they, uh, they want to do that in a healthy way. Uh, in a way that, you know, they can do this with people that want to have this done consensually, you know, will, do I necessarily think that inclination is healthy? I don't know. I mean, do we have lions that generally eat everything in the jungle too? If we had lions that only ate, people, ate animals that consented to it, it'd be better, I guess. I don't know. Um, <laughs> there's no one size fits all. This, yeah. we get back to this whole thing about there's nothing unusual about any of this. We all feel somewhat feminine, somewhat masculine, somewhat dominant, somewhat submissive. We all like what we like, and that may stay the same. That may change from one week to the next, the things that make us really turned on. We're, we're humans. Our mind works that way. For me, kink is just the ability to talk about that and to try yeah. and find healthy ways to express yourself. And as uh, long as it's done you know, in a safe and sane way, or at least at least a risk aware way, I think it's okay. Yeah, I believe everybody has has these. I don't want to say tendencies, but everybody has a fantasy that entails something forbidden in some way. And and actually, I had a conversation recently that the best fantasies, the best yeah, the best fantasies are those that that are forbidden because it gives us the sense of of friction. That, that if we can resolve that friction, it actually helps us open up to them. And so I, where I was going to go with this is that, I mean, things that are forbidden, like why would they be forbidden? Like to be spanked? Like who the hell cares? What's what's the – there's nothing strange about that, you know, about spanking. I mean, certainly, you know, I'm Gen X, so spanking was a very big part of my life. That was even before I was 12, you know, it wasn't even sexy. So, but, so I don't know, for, like something forbidden is kink only just what's forbidden because what's forbidden is only forbidden for social reasons. There, there's no yeah. objective if you, if you law. Take a, if you take a macro view of this whole stuff, it's just energy. Yeah. The strong, the, the, the bigger the drop off the cliff. So if it's, if it's a higher cliff, it's right. going to have more power before you hit the bottom. That 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 seems like something that I shouldn't do. Therefore, it right. has more energy. I always like to say, you know, people are analog. We're waves. You know, we have we go up and down. We're, we're waves. We're energy. The bigger that wave, you know, it's, it's wave and amplitude. So the bigger the wave or the bigger the amplitude or the, you know, we're just, that's it. We just, we're like music. We want what we want. Some people, we can only, you know, for big amplitude is, oh my goodness, I'm stealing a dollar from my from my budget for the milk and I'm putting it in the budget for the beer. I'm like, God, I'm horror. And that's where some people it's more dramatic, but it's whatever you feel, it's it's just energetic. It's the energetic difference between this place and this place. You know? Uh, call it what you want. Energetic people will call it magic. People will call it kink. People call it psychology. But it's just in the end, it's we are analog and everything is just energetic waves and uh, the stronger the differential between what we want to do and what we can do, the more intense that is going to be, the bigger the bang, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That was a great analogy. I appreciate the The bigger the, the difference between peak and trough. <laughs> I want to think exactly. about it like that. 
That's beautiful. Yeah, which is why some people that are more more psychopath. I mean, people people you throw that word around a lot, but um, ninety five, I believe, or ninety eight percent of psychopaths are highly functioning individuals, usually doctors, lawyers, because you know. Right. And I, frankly, if I if I had to have an operation, I want a surgeon psychopath. I don't want someone crying into my chest cavity as they're doing. You want someone who's talking about his golf game as he sews you up. He doesn't. There's no empathy whatsoever. He's like, right. okay, yeah, he's maybe he dies, maybe he lives. I do my best, but you know, my handicap on my golf score is this, and I'm going to be doing that. You want that guy? You don't want? I'd be like, oh my god, I have a human life in my hand. Oh my god, this! I'd be crying into the chest cavity. The yeah. person would die. So you know, maybe for a psychopath, that, that I think there. That's why some of the people that are like, the more you like that, the more scared you are with playing with these energetic waves, because yeah. I think for them it's bigger. It's bigger than for you and I. It might be just like get spanked and not supposed to be spanked for them. It might be more dramatic. It might be, yeah. you know, something that was really, you know, um, a little out there and they might not know how to express it, you know, but I think even a kid could find that I, I seem to have, have, uh, gotten into this thing or a reputation for doing this really hardcore, fantasies with people i've met a couple of women that what like the idea of being kidnapped and taken away and have this very elaborate kind of whatever that's very 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 yeah, dark yeah. and i love being a filmmaker i love setting up these very elaborate scenes so i've done it a couple of times to rave reviews and now i seem to be getting references to do it for more people but it's very extreme scenarios yeah. that you really have to have a lot of trust and you have to person has to know a lot about a lot of different things to make sure it can be done in a certain way that it has the terror that they want, but it's completely, you know, ultimately safe, but they don't really ever know for sure it's safe, but they're pretty sure. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you know, for people that are really, and these are usually high functioning, the last person I did for was a very successful lawyer in England. And she, uh, I think she had a very dark kind of extreme kind of thing that she wanted that she couldn't, she was really looking for. And you yeah. certainly wouldn't be something you know, that, that, that energetic total power to no power, total control over everyone to be kidnapped and to be taken off in somewhere, you know, like her extreme was much bigger than most, you know? Yeah. Yes. The, I, it's a great example to use a, a surgeon that, you know, you have to have people who, who are capable of shutting off the empathy. Cause I agree. Like if I were a surgeon, like, Oh, I think it would be tough to, to, you know, find a patient and go, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't help you. But you got doctors who can walk right in and just go, yeah, sorry. Let me shake your hand now because I'm not going to be able to do it next time. Well, because I'm not going to see you again, kind of thing. <laughs> but but mm. one of the, um, oh, I'm forgetting his name, but one of the people in, in the film, In Touch Kink, said the biggest word in kink is no. I think I'm I think I'm quoting that properly. Yeah, that, no means no and yes means yes, yeah. Yeah. That that well, I'm so I forget his name. Ern, Ernest Ernest Green. Ernest okay, Green. Thank you. So so he and that was that's a huge point because if you like if you went into a, a surgeon and, and he said, look, I've got to, you know, I've got to do whatever. I've got to take a tumor out, whatever. And you went, oh, no, no. The doctor's not going to go. OK, well, that's cool. No, that's fine. He's going to go, what are you talking about? I'm going to fix you. Shut up. Lie down. Put the mm -hmm. thing on your face, whatever. But, but, a, but, a, a, you know, a dominatrix isn't. If you go, no, sorry, hurts, she's going to stop. Right. So these are people. No, you said, not necessarily. <laughs> that was no, depends what the safe word is. Oh, okay. Well, okay. In, their, in their context, no is generally not a safe word. No, well, fair word enough. But it's not a safe word. It's usually pineapple or something or red, green, blue uh, is the classics. But no, half but, the fun is they know you're hurting me. No, you're hurting me. Not hurting you. Safe word. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. But I was safe using word. that as the negative. But right. Yeah, I so get yes, right. But, but, uh, you know, but so that's a great point, actually. So, I mean, there's, yeah, how, how much no is no, like at what point is no, does no become no, 
that's a whole conversation in itself. But hopefully, you worked that out during the negotiation before you got consent. Right. You know, right. before the, you 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 better have that worked out. I, I love the old traffic lights. Red means stop. Yellow means slow down a bit. Green means this is great. So I'm like, no, no, stop! You're hurting me. Green. No, no, stop! You're hurting me. It hurts so bad. Green. Yes, go green. <laughs> But but you 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 need the you need so I guess the point is the point I was going toward is that you you I agree you do need the psychopaths in society you need the people who are like I'm not going to listen to you I'm afraid we're just gonna you know I'm not going to say sorry either I'm just not going to listen to you no I think I don't I don't think you well they should still listen there should still be consent there should be informed like even well, con- in the, consent I started yes. seeing I you know what, I, you know what I honestly maybe I drank the Kool Aid but I, I see. The lessons learned in kink should be everywhere, from relationships, Agreed. business, medical, yeah. whatever. I'm going. I'm not going to make any assumptions. I'm going to let you tell me what you want or you need, and we'll talk about it. We'll agree to something. We'll do it. We'll follow up. Uh, I don't, you know, if if part of it is this this notion risk aware consent, where someone maybe or consensual non consent. That was I'm a little edgy on that one, but whatever. If you're consenting to to no longer have the right to stop something. I can see it. It's a bit edgy for me, but you know, even that. But there has to still be some rules to the rules to it somehow. Just to, you know, I'm too pretty to go to jail. I'm I'm pretty hardcore, Max. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty damn Uh, hardcore. uh Oh, uh oh, I'm afraid of you. It's not true at all. No, but I did. I wanted to get up on the microphone so that I could do that voice. That was really the whole point of it. Mm Hmm. Was it, does it sound dramatic? Does is it sounds does it sound pretty very, cool? Sounds pretty dramatic. Yeah, for sure. Does it does it sound sexy at all? Yes, no. that too. No, it's all oh, crap. It was not an immediate yes. If it's not an immediate yes, it's a no, and that's fine. Yeah, I don't mind. I'm, it. I'm still. I'm seeing you as a still princess. So you know the purple princess. <laughs> <you> know, <that's, laughs> right. It's hard for me to. Hard for me to feel threatened by a princess. But it really I, yeah. is. It really is. No, I walk into the room and people go, oh, this will be fun, rather than, oh, crap. All right, everybody shut up. You know, nobody does that. So it's. But actually, well, actually, some of the best dominatrixes I've noticed do that. Like, it's the ones that kind of walk into a room with the sort of like, you know, you should be afraid that I actually have nowhere to go. It's the ones that are like, come in super polite and super gentle. Point. They figure a little about, oh, so he likes to talk about his movie and he's admitted this and this. I'm going to use this. And they come in at the right moment. They're like, woof. And you're like, oh, it's, it's, they're mm-hmm. smart. And they, they start yeah. to lower the trough of the wave. Uh, and then they sort of energetically build. That seems to be the yeah. real genius yeah. is, is nothing, there's nothing less dominant than someone telling you they're dominant. Oh, that's a good point. You know, people, I'm a dom, I eat dom from practice. You're not. If you have to tell me you're a dom, you're not a dom. You should carry yourself a certain way. You should be a certain way and let that person decide if they are. You put a a hundred submissive people together and someone's going to merge as the most dominant person in that group and run the group. Right. You know, it's just, it's human nature, but it shouldn't be. But it's never the person that says, you know, there's nothing weaker than saying that. Unless, of course, you know, you're, point. you've literally paid a bunch of money to see this person in a professional situation. And they're, then you have to, yes, of course, yes, Mr. Yes, Master, whatever, right. because that's already been established. But in normal human interactions, there's nothing less dominant than saying you're a dominant. Yeah. No, I'm with you. It, just, it reminds me of a story. I went dancing in Hollywood. This was probably year 2000. So it's been a while. But somebody came up to him. So I'm dancing alone because that's what I was doing. And somebody comes up and, and looks me in the eye and goes, I'm going to dominate you. Uh, okay. And I was like, nope, you lost that chance. So, you know, if you walked up and said, I'm going to dominate you and then took my hand and led me off, you know, the dance floor. Sure. But like to ask, hey, is that cool? You all right with it? Are you going to? No, no, you missed it. Sorry. Well, you, I think there's a thousand me? different approaches. I, I, okay. I'm a geeky guy, so I probably might have been that guy. I would be like, "Hey, well, no, I wouldn't. No, well, who knows? You, you, you know, everyone, everyone does things differently. You know, uh, it's good that that person was maybe thinking about trying to get consent first. Um, 
But yeah, it depends on okay. where you are. It depends on the dynamic. I certainly, if you're at a masters and slaves dinner and one's wearing leather and one, I love these like clothed uh, female or clothed male, uh, naked female, naked. You know, they'll have one where like one gender is uh, wearing clothes and one gender is uh, is nude. Then it's sort of fairly implicit that the people wearing clothes are in charge. Probably <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> Probably. You know, then, then that's part part of the deal. Or high, I love high protocol for that. Like, then you can go straight into it. A high protocol situation is lots of fun, especially if everyone knows all the rules of high protocol. But you know, it's all situational too. It's not different, much different than I'm in Japan. I'm taking my shoes off when I walk into your house. So I'm in Germany. I'm keeping my shoes on. You know, mm. all this protocol. Oh, see now, now mm-hmm. you're opening up new new avenues. Lights are turning on in my head. I do. Want to, let's talk about your film, though. I did. So, Touch Kink is the name of the film, which I love because I love because that it's the O that is capitalized. So, I like how you're bringing out the idea of ouch that there's some that there's there's touch involved, but also pain involved, and and I guess I I want to. One of the movies that that really stood out to me when I was younger was Hellraiser. Well, actually the book first, but um, The Hellbound Heart by Clive Barker. But the idea, um, one of the lines is pleasure and pain indivisible or indistinguishable, I think is what it was. And we we have that quoted that in an article. Once. <laughs> but it's it's um, the line between the two are very is very thin. Um, let me before we talk any more about your movie, can, can you talk about that just briefly, like the why that line is thin? I don't actually think it is for everyone. I think for some people it's far clearer than others. I think it's a bit of a cliche, to be honest. Um, pain and pleasure for some people, maybe. Um, there's actually a fascinating uh, study going out of McGill right now where they've discovered the masochist gene. Where they, they've okay. actually been, and the, the guy's been going around to different kink events and doing DNA testing for with some people who identify as masochists tend to have this gene. They literally feel something different than other people. So maybe people where they sense pain for them, it's a real. I mean, we can only judge those things from our experience. For me, pain and pleasure are very different. For a masochist, they, they're much closer. But I think that's something to do with uh, that's only true on an individual level. I don't think we can speak. Generally, and certainly artistic people or certain people are more inclined. Well, that that isn't a big difference. Um, What I find more interesting is one of the opportunities I had is uh, is I I am a top, uh, more dominant, but um, and I sort of was a little up in my own whatever for a long time. But I had the opportunity to sub to one of the most experienced dominatrixes in the world. And she gave me a four hour session, starting with a little spanking. I was blindfolded four hours later, bits of my flesh were being ripped off blood going down. I didn't notice, but when I stopped, I was in total joy. Holy it was cats. like, I've never tried heroin, but I'm pretty sure this is what it feels like because yeah. she, the expertise, the genius of these people with this kind of level of skill is they slowly ramp it up to the edge of what you can take. And then once you could take more, they take a little bit more. And then your body is giving you happy juice, Mm. giving you whatever your body gives you to deal with the pain. And when the pain stops, your body's filled with this happy juice, which I think is something similar to heroin. And I just laid on the floor and imagining this, I mean, just pure ecstasy, pure joy, pure pleasure. It wasn't the pain I liked. It was the effect. And that's the big distinction. I would argue a lot of people, nobody likes pain. They like the way that enduring pain makes them feel. And that's an important distinction. I don't think they really, you know, step their toe and go, oh, my God, that's great. They, well, they like the way, you know, they, they, they like yeah. the, the use of pain as a stimuli to get the body to produce happy juice. That's my my take on it. So, yeah. And for lack of another way, they say, "Oh, there's no difference between pain and pleasure." Okay, yeah. Step your toe on the step your toe on the door, or smash your head against a wall and have sex. And you tell me which feels better. You know, you tell me those two things feel the same for you. Then there's there's no line between pain. And, I think it's a bit poetic, and I think it's a bit of a misnomer. To even the concept of masochist, I think it's a bit of a misnomer because they don't actually. I, I still to date haven't met masochists that genuinely like actually the pain they like the way the pain makes them feel yeah 
Yes. Maybe that's the... When I asked that question and, and you started talking, I thought, oh, shit, I think I just doubted myself as a masochist, didn't I? Which is fine. But I like the way that you describe that, that it is, I think that is that that thin line that you go, oh, I got some pain. Stubbing your toe sucks. But being spanked by, you know, mistress, whatever. In the oh, right way, in the right context, yeah. the right the yeah. right level of pain expertly given to you in a way that creates you're not you're, it's the sensation that you're achieving otherwise yeah, yeah okay yeah. oh your masochist just keeps smashing your head your toe against the wall right. that would be maybe yeah. truly like pain why not just go <laughs> right. put your hand in a you know toe in you a blender like, yeah it has to be administered the right way yeah. it has to be uh, in the right context it's not pain it's situational it's like a you know a lot of people love to jump out of an airplane because it scares them. You know, with a parachute, yeah. if it's boring to jump out of a, nobody jumps out of a, an airplane going as a parachuting expert because it's boring. They get a thrill. Of they course, get the yeah. risk. They get the endorphins. They get the adrenaline. If they if they didn't feel there was any danger and there was nothing to it, they probably wouldn't enjoy it. It's controlled. Right. It's a controlled environment. And I think that's something that people who aren't into kink often understand oh some i've heard that you know like uh you know why don't masochists just like you know stub their foot on the door all the time if they like pain so much you know it's much more nuanced than that that was a great explanation that was really that was very very well done it it also puts me in mind and now i'm forgetting this guy's name too but there there was the the text the guy from my favorite in the the movie by the way was the guy robin robin thank you wait was it yeah okay Yes, you're right. Sorry. You did the film, you know, but I loved that guy. Every time he came on screen, he's really jovial looking, you know, he's like, oh yeah, you know, some, sometimes I get, you know, a high heel up the ass and you just roll with the punches or something. I don't remember exactly, but I was like, wow, you know, what a, what a guy. He just seemed, he seemed like he would be a great guy just to hang around, you know. He is super. Super intelligent, super self-aware, uh, able to articulate things in yes. a very so folksy way. Yeah, no, he was great. Yes. He became so the pr- surprising star of the film. Absolutely. I so I loved him. Um, what the? Why did I bring him up? Um, oh, I think it was really it was the the sort of down home, matter of fact way that he could talk about. Mm-hmm that division for him that, that, you know, cause, cause he is a submissive. Sorry. If I didn't make, make that clear to at the beginning. He's actually, yeah, he's actually a masochist. He, he's a masochist. He likes the way it feels. Ooh, can I you, think. can you describe the difference there? Maybe I don't know the difference between submissive and masochist. Well, submissive is someone who is uh, submissive is more of a, a way of behavior. I will be submissive. I'll be deferential. Right. I will do as All you right. say. I may or may not like pain. I mean, there are lots of dominants that are masochists. There are dominants that have their slaves beat the hell out of them. Because, you know, I, you will beat me wow. because I like pain. Uh, you know, that's why there's a differentiation between dominant and submissive and top and bottom. You could be a dominant bottom. You could be a submissive top. Interesting. Theoretically. You know, one is just doing the action. One is receiving the action. I mean, that's that's one of the, the things I always try to explain to people when they ask about kink is that, you know, there's a tendency you walk into a kinky party. Let's say you see 10 couples getting spanked. Oh, okay. Some people like to get spanked. They walk away. Um, what they need to understand is every single one of those couples is having a unique experience. One might be being close to orgasm and, and joyful, same stuff. Next person's feeling pain. One might be a dominant having a submissive spank him. You don't know, but I guarantee, even though it looks the same, every one of those People's having a completely unique experience yeah. because that's what humans are. Now, you, if you're into spanking, you probably know there's like, you know, spankings that can actually give you more pleasure and spankings that can give you more pain and spankings that are kind of right in the middle. Just by your action, uh, sort of top to the bottom tends to hurt a bit more. Top, you know, bottom to the top, let it jiggle a bit. It's a bit more you can make someone orgasm. Yeah. Middle depends, you know. So even that, I mean, there's just so nuanced. There's so much variety. And, you know, again, humans are analog. 
You know, we're all on spectrums of this and spectrums of that. I hate boxes. I've always hated the gay, the straight, the hell, the boy, the girl. I'd go for right. masculine, maybe feminine, maybe uh, toppy, bottomy, more dummy, less dummy. Uh, you know, you know, let's get past some of these old boxes. You know. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, I didn't. I, I'm going to admit, I didn't. I always equated like submissive with masochist, and 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 maybe yeah. it's just because that's my experience and I only see at this point my own experience, but do you, you know, I, there were other things I was going to talk about, but you reminded me of something. And I don't remember if we talked about it while recording or while we were just talking before, but the idea of labels, you said now everybody's queer, which is weird. Cause you can point to somebody and go, well, aren't you a lesbian? Aren't you a gay? Why don't, why don't we, uh, you know, why, why are we calling ourselves queer? I actually kind of like that because it means we're throwing out many labels, right? If you can just go, yeah, I'm part of this non-mainstream expression, I think that's beautiful because labels don't help us in any way, really. As you've pointed out, we're all on multiple axes of spectra that you know define a human, not, not a label. I feel like that should have been more profound, but... No, 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 you're right. I mean, you know, labels, uh, even labels do have a purpose. It's like, I want to meet you on the corner of Main Street and 2nd. Get you to a general neighborhood, but let's not assume that you're all about being Main Street and and 2nd. We've just found our little area now. Let's get to know each other. It's this this, uh, other idea that it's okay to be very conservative, very whatever, public facing, very polite, uh, whatever you want. There's this public facing thing that, you know, whatever the culture is, try and follow those cultural norms and don't be weird. Don't be that guy yeah. that's, yeah. you know, you don't walk into Walmart wearing, you know, your, your, your leather wear, or, or although I have, um, <laughs> some, some but, people you know, do, for, you know, you, whole, you try to website show devoted to that. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think it's necessarily cool to be disrespectful to a community. Sure. I think if you understand the rules and you try and be as respectful as you can, um, but you can also be as wild and wonderful as you want in your private time. And one does not mean anything about the other. There's at least two yous. There's the, the public you and the, the respectful cultural you trying to get along in your society right. and your culture. And there's the private you. Uh, and that, that it may be different. You may be different. There may be a different private you with one person that you interact with than another, but that's okay. You're human. You don't have to be one static thing all the time. Right. There's nothing dishonest about that. Right. And that's the thing I try to get to is people think it's somehow, oh, that's weird. He's like so dominant day. And then he's submissive at night. Oh my God, what a weird person. It's like, well, actually that sounds like a very evolved person to have all those ways of self-expression. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the the way I've put that in in my own work is to say because I believe that each of us has to negotiate with our social environment. So we have a, what, who we know we are, and then there's a negotiation within our social environment to express wh- who that person is. And I think a lot of what we see in we- particularly in Western society is the idea that there's only one social environment. And there's not. There are bajillion social environments. Depends mm-hmm. on where you are. You go to work. That's different. You come home. That's different mm-hmm. as a parent. You know, even in the bedroom. And we don't we don't recognize that it's really the social environment changing, not the person. The person mm-hmm. is the same person. That negotiation changes based on where you are, who you're with. So that's a thank you. I, that was a great. I love that yeah. uh, that explanation. It, it's an important. It's a really so important for people to recognize, and I think it's also one. I, I keep seeing pink everywhere, and I think it's so beneficial for people just to understand, accept, and and realize all of these things. And some of the things maybe people aren't necessarily kinky. People sometimes have a hard time with the rest of the world that's not kinky and kind of want to force it on them, like I'm yeah. going to do this in public or whatever. Well, that's wrong right. too. Because you haven't got their consent and they're not maybe ready for that. You know, it's better to just understand and recognize where they are. I look at my own life and I've been lucky enough to travel and have all these opportunities. And and I learned a lot making this movie that I would have never learned if I hadn't been exposed to this world. So Mm -hmm. none of us know it all. And so it starts from a place of respect 
especially in a public thing, and then privately start from a place of, okay, tell me who you are and tell me what you like and open and honest and uh, let's see how we interact, you know? Right, right. It It's a really, it's a recipe for, for a, like a fair and just society, isn't it? To, to, to meet people where they are. That's all it is. Gosh, I didn't and think that this it, and, 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 and to take the time, I don't want to get too geopolitical, so I'm not going to name any countries at war with each other <laughs> or anything, but if you were at war with another country or having conflict, it's, in, it's probably more useful to understand why, why they're doing mm. it than it is just to say they're bad. Okay, I'll use Russia. Um, I'm not a fan. I don't think it's horrible what they're doing or whatever. But if you put it in the context of a country that lost, you know, 30 million people in the war and the only thing that's ever saved right. them is having lots of land mass around them. And as far as they see, this group, big group of powerful people are getting closer and closer and closer. I think it maybe understand it a little bit. I don't agree with it. I think it's wrong or whatever, but it's not is just, oh, this evil person wants to take this. There's there's right. there's geopolitical right. You see, just taking the time to try and understand, you don't have to agree with. I don't have to agree with why you do it, but I'd like to hear why. I love to, I, I've converted more more than a few uh, Trump supporters to, to, the, uh, to the other side by listening, letting them talk. Because yeah. no one at Lewis Hupel usually will shut them down. Oh, you're crazy. You believe this. Why do you right. believe this? And it usually comes down to privilege. They had had so much privilege in their life. And the truth is they are losing privilege. You don't get as much free pass as just for being a white man as you used to get. True. And that's what really, and, and you know what? Uh, that's a reality. So they're not wrong. Yeah, life isn't as good for me as it used to be. Yeah, you're right. But do you have a daughter? Do you have females you care about in your life? Would you like to see, do you have maybe someone of, a, of another ethical, ethic, uh, ethnic background? Do you want them to have a better, you realize they didn't have the chances you have. And what's happening right. in society is sort right. of a rebalancing. Do you not want, do you want to keep your advantage just based on the fact that you have a penis and white skin? Do you think that's cool? Or do would you like to see, and they're like, oh, I never really thought of it that way. You know? Most of them just don't realize, you know, you, they did work hard. They did earn what they did. They did all of those things they say they did. They just didn't realize how lucky they were. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that always fascinates me, and I think this we're, we're saying the same thing, is the idea that there are really no bad guys. You know, we every movie has the good guys and the bad guys, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the that's the entire you know, that's our entire fiction <laughs> arc of fiction, good guys and bad guys. But the bad guys is a matter of perspective. Like those people are what they, they think they're the good guys. They're like, well, I got a purpose for what I'm doing. And these, uh, these bad guys are trying to keep me from doing it. And if you were to, if you actually, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. And then, well, if you look at history, even a cursory thing in history, most of the most evil things in the world were done by men of good intention. I mean, the British thought they were bringing civilization by wiping right. out cultures. Right. They thought right. they were helping the Canadians, our people. You know, we were cast, we were chemically forced sterilizing Aboriginal people because we thought it would, you know, help them, and they couldn't help themselves. We were taking their children away because we wanted to help them have better lives. The truth is. Very few people were actually that dark. Most people really, and this is the scary part, really of heart and mind were convinced they were helping. They were helping mm -hmm. these people. And sure. that's the thing people don't understand. You don't understand evil until you realize that most of evil is just good old-fashioned ignorance. Yeah, It's just ignorance. It's just a lack of knowledge. It's a lack of yeah. cultural perspective. And you grew up in a society where we're going to, the purple people are evil. So we have to go to war with them. <laughs> I, off, I, keep, I, you know, I secretly keep hoping and I have these constant dreams that the Martians evade. Because I think we'd have world peace in a week. Every nation on earth, be us humans against the oh, Martians. Great. Everything would be put aside in a week, be this beautiful harmony of man as the whole world, you oh, know, sure. unified to fight the Martians. Be like, you yeah. know, Ayatollah with the with the president, with Putin, you know, working it, you know, to figure it, it's just way it's the way people are, you know? It yes, it is. You had to bring up the purple people too. Right, that's my that's my kingdom, or at least my princessdom at this point. So, yeah, 
the, in, in I was just using of, color. I didn't mean any. I wasn't actually meaning any community by purple people. I was no, looking for know, sort of a random, <laughs> random thing. I could have should have said mauve or something. I don't know. No, 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 no. Um, it worked. Great. It worked great. But I agree with you. Right. If we had if we had a common enemy, we would all band band together. I mean, it was fascinating to watch Congress. You know, September twelfth, two thousand one. Right. I mean, all of a sudden there was no aisle. Right. It was like, hey, America's being attacked. We better do something. And everybody, you know, even against their better judgment, was voting as, as a you know, proposed patriot. And I think we would do this if, we, if the entire planet were under attack. We would go, mm, I am a human. As soon, exactly. As soon as the society sees value in something, all of a sudden it becomes – I'm actually quite convinced that at some point in the not-so-distant future um, – sexual and kink and uh, diversity is going to be much embraced more seriously because the one thing that that kinky people are or, or diverse sexually diverse people as we're more mm-hmm. creative we're more nuanced mm-hmm. and you know the future is about ideas the future is going to be about creativity it's not going to be about who can lift the biggest rock and move it from a to b or who's the toughest guy machines are going to be tougher than any of the toughest people the only thing yeah. mach- the only ma- the ma- machines aren't going to be the one going let's see what happens if we take a louboutin shoe and stick up his ass while he sings <laughs> this oh and i just figured out a way to do quantum computing you know <laughs> don't laugh right. I don't no, laugh i you know, da Vinci was a, Leonardo da Vinci, arguably one of the geniuses of our time, was arrested for crimes against humanity or crimes against, well, what was it? Crimes against nature, I think it was called. I he was by and a bit kinky. And sure. luckily, you know, he just wasn't cool. But, you know, he had, he got out of that, no problem. But a lot of Alan Turing, you know, all of, right. a lot of the crazy, they were, had a different, they didn't follow what they were told to follow. They followed something truer. It was hard for them. Uh, in Turing's case, he was chemically castrated and committed suicide, but he also invented the computer. You know, it, there is a genius to it. You look at some of the top, I don't know too many vanilla, you know, classic football type, you know, all of them that, that are in doing amazing things in terms of research and technology or yeah. it takes it takes a creative mind. So I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that we're, and I think it's starting, you, you might even starting to see it happen when governments are starting to fund more of this and, you know, it's okay to do, but they're starting to realize actually, yeah, this is actually smart. We need these ideas. We need these brains. This is an advantage. Yeah. Right. I, gosh, I told, I didn't think we were going to get off on this. I got to tell you though, I totally agree. I mean, I think that there is an advantage, an evolutionary advantage to a society capable of of expressing and accepting exactly everything we're talking about, you know, because Mm -hmm. when you do that, you have a society better capable to adapt and hence an evolutionary advantage. But, you know, I didn't know anything about evolution, but gosh, what a great point. Such a great point. Um, I, you know, I think we could go continue to talk forever about this. And I barely even talked about your film. <laughs> we barely talked about your film, which is... Touch King, Touch King, Touch King. Put right. your little graphics up. Go to touchking.com. You, you know, I was asked the question, hey, are you going to show a clip? And I was like, ooh, I didn't think about that. Like I should have. I should have queued something up, but I didn't even you think can, about it. Edit it in afterwards. We'll see if I can edit something in. But I wanted to... Can you just tell us? Because I mean... This is a, it's an exceptional film, by the way, I got to tell you, it was, I hit play and I was like, yeah, I don't know. I'm curious what this is going to be about. And then seeing the diversity of people made me go, holy cats. Yeah, this is so, especially Robin, you know, like I said, Robin, I just went, gosh, yeah, this is so crazy. It's such a representation of like all of humanity. Did you set out to do that? I mean, did you did you go? Oh, I'm no. going to go to this LA convention and 
no, no, no. Are... I've, been, I've been I've been criticized for the opposite, actually. Um, well, come no, the, on. Uh, it, it's a, no, I have. I've I've been saying, oh, I don't. I didn't feel represented. I don't see a diversity there. Mm. I didn't label. I didn't label who was transgender. There are several transgender. I, I don't care about that stuff. Sure. And I ask, how do you want to be defined? You're a dom. You're a mistress. You're a slave. I write that. Right. I'm not going to go uh, trans. If you said identify as a transgender, this I'll write that in. But you know. Uh, People who just didn't feel that, you know, it was representational enough. And, and it's funny because I was like, okay, well, I, you know, you have no idea which huh. but that's okay. Um, no, the truth was these were the people I met. I, I interviewed yeah. over 200 people and I followed them for about a year. And the people that something happened, whether it was some conflict or some story or something interesting, it became the story of people that, yeah, I'm still fine. Everything's still fine. I'm still kinky and everything's still kinky. Yeah. There wasn't really any arc there. So no, it was completely random. It was just of the 200 people I met, I followed up with about 50. And of the 50 I followed mm -hmm. up with, about three or four had something happen. So those became the core of the story and the arrest became the, the choir or the commentary. Yeah. There was, yeah. No, there was no, there was no, there was no agenda. It was to try to be as honest um and uh, and deal with it uh, deal with what happens you know that's amazing cuz it turns into i mean it's really a story of like becoming it was almost you know uh, joseph campbell's got his you know the the every story Our is a is darkness. a you, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, well, no, I'm thinking the, the of the hero's, hero's journey. Hero's journey yes. yeah. yeah. It was interesting to see um like a hero's journey, even within, I mean, though, cause the one I'm thinking of, um, I don't know why every name has flown out of my head, but the, the lady with the short blonde hair, the one who took dominatrix lessons. Great. Grace. Thank you. Okay. I mean, it was a, it was a, a, um, figurative death. There was a rebirth. There was a becoming, like what the hell is that? That's a hero's yeah, journey, right, right there, right? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Well, the the hero's journey is crossing from the known to the unknown, intervening right? angels, some sort of new knowledge, some sort of atonement, returning to the known world with some new knowledge. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. But it's funny. A lot of people is it's, oh, it's like oh, that's so set up. That's face. Like no, I I did suspect she was more dominant and kinky than she knew she was because I had met <laughs> sure. her years before, and um, you know she's. Yeah, a lot of like she's very, very beautiful woman. I don't know. A lot of men find me a bit bitchy and a bit dumb and a bit like, well, bitchy, I think was the word she used. I'm like, okay. I know what that is, but I, you know, she didn't have the language. You're like, you're just naturally quite dominant. She used to always love and military boys, a lot of her, you know, partner. And, sure. And she ended up falling in love with marrying like literally someone in like SEAL Team Six kind of guy who's like okay. the biggest, <laughs> baddest ass you could probably imagine, but likes, yes, ma'am. <laughs> You know, they found the perfect love, two beautiful children, yeah. but it was help, help, understanding that dynamic and that some people will love you for that and some people won't. And that's OK. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I knew she I kind of thought she'd figure it out. And I'm glad she did. Yeah. No, it was a beautiful it's a beautiful journey. The whole I, I'm amazed that you could be criticized for not. I mean, I guess if I were to think back, the people who stood out are white so I can see, can see some of that. But like you said, you know, you go with the people who are interesting. I mean, when you're doing a documentary, the idea is to be a documentarian, not, uh, you know, not necessarily. Boxes. I'm not, yeah. if I was making a Hollywood uh, production for the mainstream right now, or I can cast it, I'm certainly going to cast with a more representational, of course. Uh, uh, but that, you know, that was who yeah. I met, but yeah. Yeah, that that was the thing, and I was like, "Oh, okay." I, I could see you thinking that way, but you know, I, I've taken to this notion. And I always talk to different people that are musicians or filmmakers. The same thing that when people say that they could have done it or that it looks like such easy, it wasn't very hard to do. That's actually a compliment. Oh, sure. Because yeah. because if it if it looks like it's so easy and I could have done that, that means that you did it right. Because it's it's easier for them to sort of point out things mistakes we're visually and auditorily quite sophisticated so we know when things are wrong we expect things to be right so the fact that that was all they had wasn't too bad um, no you know i would imagine they, oh, it would have been e it would have been easy just to add a few more people from uh, other backgrounds I'm like okay did you feel i didn't mean anybody <laughs> yeah i believe you 
So we're, I know we're low on time. Can you can you tell us like how do we find Max Carey and in particular Touch Kink the mo- the film? How do we find all this on the internet? And how do we when you've gone to film festivals? Is is Touch Kink? Uh, I don't know what the word you use for that general release. What's the? Yeah, we just we just did a general release uh, about a week ago. It's going to be broadcast oh, okay. in uh, uh, Germany, Italy, and Israel. Have bought it for TV. It's going to be available for streaming on Kinema. If you go to Touch, well, it is actually now. If you go to touchkink.com, best thing to do is sign up for my newsletter, and I will send you geolocated yeah. messages based on when it's available. Uh, cool. The world's a big place. Um, some organizations have. Uh, Kinema is a great platform. It's a new sort of thing that lets filmmakers go directly to the audience. They, you can actually watch it in a movie theater. You can watch it in a uh, streaming. You could watch it in a virtual s- situation. If you wanted to organize the screening of the film, you could organize the screening of the film. You could do it for, for nonprofit. You can do it even for profit if you want to sell tickets oh, cool. and do it as a fundraiser. You license yeah. the film. The filmmaker gets his half, the the uh, platform gets 10%, and the host of whoever it gets gets it. So there's been a lot of um, kink organizations and sex positive organizations in the world organizing their own screenings as well, which you could do through Kinema. There's lots of different ways to see it, um, but the best thing to do is to go to touchkink.com, sign up for my newsletter, and I will send you lots and lots of information geolocated once a month. All right. That sounds awesome. Do you, you know, I, I want to talk to you about, about organizing something. I think that would be cool. I think this is uh, mm-hmm. I think it would be a great, great opportunity for all of us to, to learn and see humanity. It's, a, it's, right? a, it's, it's, a, it's also fun to, you know, you, a little bit of a fundraising thing, a couple mm-hmm. organizations. If you, if you've got a, enough of an audience and you can sell a hundred tickets, depending on what you want to charge for them, you can, you can, right. you can make a little bit of money for something as well. And, uh, you know, right. help me make some money so I can make more movies. Definitely exactly. documentaries are not how you get rich. In fact, uh, well, you yeah. want to, you want to take a bunch of money and burn it, become a documentary filmmaker. No. Yes. <laughs> no, I get that. I get that. So, well, Max, I mean, I mean, I just want to, I'll go ahead and shut things down. I think we could go over so many other things. I even said, I'm like, Hey, let's, let's bring back, uh, the topic of, of the Romans and, and how, you know, kink has been around forever in a day. And we never did. I think we could talk for another two hours and, and maybe finish. Well, the thing is, because there's nothing that the, if you want one takeaway, and I think it's the important takeaway is you're cool. There's nothing really that weird or strange. It's what you like, who you yes. are, has already been done and been there. And it's definitely cool somewhere. It was definitely cool at one point. And you'll find your community and it's okay to be you. The only thing that's bad, the only, the only thing you'd ever should shame about is hurting other people without yeah. their consent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. So let's shut it down there. Would it be, that's the great place to end. Um, so let me say, Max, thank you so much for for coming and, and talking to me. It's been a fascinating conversation. Um, and I also want to thank our listeners. And uh, so I am I am Amethyst Herrick. You're listening to Gender Identity Weekly. I've been speaking with Max Carey about his new film, Touch Kink and the BDSM and kink communities, as well as, guess what? You're cool. Thank you again, Max. 